Hey everyone, my name is Justin Woodring and this is Computing Science with Justin Woodring. Uh, today I will be showing you all how you can build a quantum circuit and run it on a quantum computer. Now this is meant to be an introductory course, so it's not going to cover the very advanced concepts that underpin how all this stuff works, uh, but it's certainly a good way to get your toes wet um, and try this out for the first time. So let's get started. Okay, so today we'll be using the IBM um, Quantum Learning and uh, Quantum pl Cloud Platform. Um, there's actually several providers out there, um, namely Azure, AWS, um, and the Google Cloud Platform. Uh, all of these have various benefits, especially if you're like, um, you deal in these cloud environments and whatnot. But IBM is uh, definitely the easiest for beginners and uh, hobbyists. Um, the company has certainly made more of an effort to try to include um, you know, would-be quantum enthusiasts who simply can't afford to run their programs out of on their own personal wallet, you know. So, um, yeah, so we'll be using IBM, and they're a great place to start if you're a beginner. So, to get started, though, um, you're going to first want to create an account. I already have one, so if I just go ahead up here and uh, click the sign-in button, we'll just go ahead and load into the cloud platform. Okay, I'm signed in now. Um, just ordering perfect uh, like I said if you don't have an account just go ahead and create one and then get back to the screen so from here we're going to be moving to the uh, we're moving to the lab so this is going to open up a little platform here and this is actually a Jupyter lab environment that's running on IBM system um, it's really neat though because it integrates more directly with their uh, with their platform so um, like I said what we're doing today is gonna be super simple this is gonna be your first program you run on an actual quantum computer so we're just gonna go ahead and just open one of these up here. And you can see they've already got some stuff here. Um, it's not exactly what we want to run to get started with. So um, I'm going to write some of my own code in here. Um, so just, let's see. Uh, we want to add a classical register up here and a quantum register. Now, um, you know, you could do this several different ways because the this entire project, um, IBM, helps to maintain like this uh, kit, kit, KISS kit, which is the Quantum Information Science Toolkit, I think. Um, and the, so they help to maintain this, and so this is kind of like their thing. It's like their toolkit for interacting with their service, and it's it's open source and extensible, so it actually can be used to interact with other services, but it's still their thing, and obviously it's going to support them more than anybody else. Um, and so we're like I said, we're using that for the platform, but Kiss Kit's kind of like, you know, it can do things multiple ways. I just choose to do it this way because it's the way that I find most comfortable. But, you know, as you um, continue your journey, you'll probably get a better understanding of how, uh, how all this stuff works. And, you know, you may choose to format these things your own way later. But um, for the time being, we're going to also add this, uh, we're gonna add this back end. So I'm gonna type this up right here. I can equal service dot least busy. Yeah, some of these things, you know, you can look them up in like documentation stuff like that, or like someone else's project or something like that. Um, I actually already worked out like this example, so I'm kind of walking you through how it's done and coding it with you. But uh, you know, if you want to skip to the end where I already have it coded out or something like that, that's cool too. You know, um, whatever works for you. It's your learning style. So. What we're doing right now is basically selecting a backend, so this would be an actual quantum computer. We're basically like, hey, pull up a quantum runtime service and then fetch me an actual quantum computer that isn't a simulator. And I'm pretty certain, yeah, I typed that wrong. Um, you want, let's be true, you want your quantum computer to work, surprisingly. Um, so now, uh, now that this is done, we're going to actually start building our circuit. So we're going to start with basically this. Uh, we're going to leave this in this block up here. And so one cool thing, if you've never used a Jupyter notebook before, is these cells can be run independently of each other, which means if you want to like make partial changes, you can. It's really neat. So we're just going to go down here. We're going to go quantum. I can't type. Quantum circuit two. And actually, we'll just do quantum circuit like that for now. Okay. Need to put that there. So you'll know earlier I told you to include this. That's where we're going to use it here. So we're going to say... Um, change this to QC, change this to QR, and say quantum register. There we go. And if I could ever type save my life. Okay, and then we go CR equals. 
Okay, cool. So we've just uh, we've just added our two registers, and then we're going to go here and we're going to include those two registers in our quantum circuit. So um, again, this is an introductory course. So if you aren't familiar with quantum register or classical register, um, you know they these some of these things are kind of hard to reason with at first but it's more or less just working with them that'll kind of get you that understanding um a quantum register is a effectively one qubit uh if you're familiar with the terminology and know anything about that it would be one instance of that and then a classical register would be one bit um again if you don't know what these things i'm going to make other videos on these topics in the future but Suffice to say, that should help us work for now, because basically, quantum things happen here, and then we use these to output our measurements effectively. So, like, when we actually decide to look at the circuit and run it, stuff like that, we're going to dump our results into these. Um, most of our computation will be occurring on the quantum register itself. So, um, let's go ahead and... What else do we want to do here? Yes, so, um, the last thing we want to do, like I said, we, when we measure, so... This next thing I'm going to type, so what we've done is just create this quantum circuit. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to type this measure. I'm going to say I want to go from QR to CR. So this basically says take the measurements of QR and map them to, um, yeah, take the measurements from QR and map them onto the classical registers. And basically that's just an operation. So Qiskit basically kind of like forms things for operations. Again, this is an introductory course, so if you don't know what an operation or gate is, it's effectively one of those. Uh, measuring is a fairly standard procedure, and it gets it can be more complicated, but it's the process of basically finally choosing to observe the qubit and actually see what like it's been doing the whole time, because usually in most of a program, it spends half its time in superposition, so you don't really know what it's doing. Uh, and then at the very end, you're like, oh, okay, this is actually what it is. So you'll see that a bit more, again, as we move along. Um, and... Also, it, again, I, it's worth pointing out here that, you know, if you don't understand all this stuff, you are, you know, you're probably a beginner, so it's not the end of the world. You know, this stuff is kind of like, you just start and then figure it out, basically. <laughs> um, just got to keep learning and keep plugging away. And using multiple resources will really help with that. So, this here, um, qc.draw, is basically going to um, actually give us a visual representation uh, using matplotlib, if you're familiar with that library. It's going to give us a visual representation of what the circuit looks like. So I'm going to run that. Oh, and oh, I never even ran this. So yeah, that's the other thing. You do have to run your Jupyter notebook cells. So we're on the first one, we're on the second one, and then whenever it decides to print it out, try it again. Let's try to see here. Um, okay, this is this one just took a while for some reason, but anyway. Um, you see it's done when this prints out and then this one was able to run after that. So I've already got a basic circuit here. Here's one qubit here. This is another qubit here. Um, so Q0 and then Q0. And then the, the bottom one actually is two classical registers and they're basically mapping as you can see. So it's like the first one's going to map to the first value, second, second qubit's going to map to the second classical register and so on. This is the absolutely most boring circuit known to mankind. Um, probably the only thing that's less interesting than that is a circuit with no measurements at all. And honestly, I don't even know how you're really supposed to run that on a quantum computer. <laughs> um, so, from here, we're going to uh, get a little bit farther down, and we're going to do something that makes it a little more interesting. So, um, we're basically going to do the same thing. Copy that, paste it down here. But the only thing we're going to add in here is a qc.h. So what this does is it basically says, before I measure, I want to run this Hadamar gate thing. Now, again, if you don't know what Hadamar gate is, it's fine. Just understand that basically it puts the qubit into a flip-flop like probability of either ending up as a 0 or a 1. It just randomizes it. It's a superposition technically, but um, it basically you don't know whether it's going to be 0 or 1, and you measure it, it could be either 1. It's like flipping a coin. Um, and that's what the Hadamar gate does. It's basically going to do that to each qubit, so you could end up with... Um, if you had the values next to each other, you'd be like 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, or 1, 1. Those are your possible values with, you know, two qubits that are being measured. Um, so, yeah, and then we could actually draw this again. Um, let's just get down, do like that. So we'll just go ahead and run this and, oh, eh, Mr. oh, you have to, you do have to, uh, apply the quantum register, so. You have to say, oh, I want to apply this to the quantum register, like that. Um, and then it should run. 
Okay, cool, cool. So now we've applied a Hadamard gate to both qubits, and then we're going to measure them again. Kind of told you what you should expect from that, but, um, you know, that's the uh, graph representation. So the next thing we're going to do is we're actually going to run this. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and find the code here. So this one's going to take a little while. Um, so I'm just going to put it in there run it so it's just you know it's not going to be done anytime soon um and then i'm just going to stop i'm going to wait for it to come back okay so that took like i don't know 15 seconds or something like that um maybe 20. um i probably could have cut it out of the video but it doesn't really matter um you can see that it changed from a star to a done now and also another way to tell if it's returned is um, this changes from busy to idle so uh, that's how you know that it's done returning the results. Um, there's actually another part of the website you can go to where you can see a list of your current jobs and see the results for it and stuff like that. So that's pretty neat, but we already obviously know that the results returned um, because, you know, of these other indicators. Um, if you want to look at that more, you could later, but what we're going to do right now is we're going to plot a... I'm going to plot a histogram of um, the data we got back. So we should be able to do a... Lots of lists, I believe. So, um, where are that? Okay, cool. Here we go. So, um, as you can see, it's representing our bits, basically. Um, our zero, zero, our zero, zero, our zero, one, our one, zero, and one, one values. Um, and they have, you can see, kind of like there's. You know, it's kind of just all around, all across the board here. Like some of them are above, some are below, but all around, they're basically all averaging out to be about one fourth of the possibilities that you can get. And that is what we would expect um, because both of these qubits have been randomized. They have no correlation to each other. So the probability of getting any one of these numbers should be the same. Um, so that's the first time we've run something on a quantum computer. It's cool. Um, because again, you basically just generate some random numbers. So let's do something a little more cool than that. Uh, we're going to try entanglement, and that should and that'll wrap up this video, and we'll discuss some more stuff in the future. But um, yeah, let's go ahead and do the entanglement part now. So I'm gonna go here. I'm gonna copy the same thing again. The only thing we're gonna do now is we're gonna add a C X gate or a C not gate. Um, it's called both, and basically this is going to statistically or it's but what it effectively does is it met it looks at the first qubit and if the first qubit is if the first qubit is one then it'll make the second qubit one and the first qubit is zero it won't do any or no i'm sorry <laughs> i got that wrong um what it does is it'll take the, if it if the first qubit is one it'll flip the orientation of the second qubit otherwise it will um if it's zero it'll leave the other qubit alone so what this should do is statistically correlate some numbers to where we basically end up with something that looks like um, 0, 0, and 1, 1. But there is an important part we have to do here first. We want the first, we want the second qubit to not be in superposition. We want it to just be chill doing its thing. So we're going to add this here, and that's going to make sure to only affect the first qubit, and you'll see when we print out our map, uh, or like our little thing. And then we're, now we're going to take the first qubit and apply it to the second qubit. So we go zero, one, two, zero, one. Like that. So let's go ahead and draw this. And again, we're just basically recreating the circuit. Okay, so we're putting the first qubit in the superposition. And then we're going to take that, map it onto the second qubit. And basically what we should end up with is either a high probability, very high probability, and almost complete gar completely guaranteed to get zero or three without getting one or two. Um, and that's because we're gonna either get zero, zero or one, one and not one, zero or zero, one in, in bit strings. Um, so let's go ahead and run this. Go ahead and find my running code. Okay. Let's see. Running it again. And I think this time I'll just let it wait, honestly. I'll clip it out for the videos too long, but. Just go back 
because he's still busy here. I'm going to grab this code while I'm at it because I'm going to run this again at the bottom. Whatever, but first returns. So these runtimes really mostly depend on whether someone else is running anything or not. Um, so like they can take a really long time sometimes and other times they're like super fast. It just kind of depends on the queue length, um, which is entirely dependent on how many people are trying to actively access the resource while you are. And bear in mind, this is a free resource. So there's basically always people trying to access it, but at certain times it's busier than others. Um, surprisingly, it doesn't seem to be super busy right now. So it's actually just finished up. Um, so you switch to idle, this thing changed. So we're gonna look at our results again. And it was, you can see, like I said, um, you have zero, zero or um, one, one. Um, and we have zero, one and one, zero are basically non-existent. There are apparently a few results still turned, um, returned zero, one, and probably it's likely that a few results may have even returned uh, the other um, uh, one, zero. But that is actually an error. That's a noise error. Um, so ideally in the future, quantum computers won't do this because this is not what we want. We want them to basically do this and this and not this. Um, but that's basically it for the day. Um, as you can see here, we have built ourselves a basic uh, little program that entangles qubits and then plots the results and we ran them on an actual quantum computer. So um, you should be proud of yourself, especially if it's like your first time uh, doing anything with quantum computing. Um, and honestly, even if you've been studying quantum computer forever and this is the first time you're actually trying to run something on a quantum computer, you should still be proud of yourself. Um, it's definitely a first, uh, major first step and uh, yeah. So pat yourself on the back, congratulations, um, and I'll be making more content like this in the future, so like and subscribe.